and since this is January, the thing itself and how it works, the readings are from Ernest Holmes. In the first, he says, it is the invisible essence and substance of every visible form. Its nature is goodness, wisdom, and beauty, as well as energy and determination. Our highest satisfaction comes from a sense of conscious union with this invisible life. In the second, he says, the life which we live is universal life expressing through us, else how could we live? Our thought and emotion is the use we make consciously or unconsciously of this original creative thing that is the cause of everything. So that is. <laughs> Ah, welcome to those of you that have just arrived in the sanctuary, as Michelle said. Woo! You've grown. <laughs> uh, the theme for the month of January is uh, principle and intention. And as many people have already surmised, like Michelle earlier said, oh, I love January. Or others people said, as so, you know, knowing it's January, we're doing the thing itself. So once again, it's January. And... As most of the other centers for spiritual living across the world, we too are taking an opportunity to revisit the basic fundamental underlying principles of the science of mind philosophy and way of life. It's an opportunity to hear them in a new way, to hear them in a deeper way. Um, I always laugh because at my Science of Mind textbook, uh, of which I actually have three, one whose binding is completely all falling apart, and the others who have, you know, underlying, underlining and highlighting and brackets and stars and flags and all these different kinds of things from all of the different times I've read them. And the really wonderful news is that every time I read them, I see or read something in a new way. I hear it. It lands on me. I'm different as I'm reading it. So January, even though we are once again talking about these underlying principles, it's an opportunity to stay open to hearing them in a new way, in a deeper way. An opportunity to, to really continue or to begin, maybe, in, some, in the case of some people, to really bring these principles and practices into our everyday lives in a really powerful way. So my talk title is The Thing Itself. It's a combination of the thing itself and the way it works. Now, the thing itself is a phrase that Ernest Holmes uses in the Science of Mind textbook. And the thing itself is the one presence, the one power in the universe. Now, I happen to call it God, but it goes by many different names. Spirit, life, love, the universe, uh, the absolute first cause, consciousness, or maybe even nothing at all. It, it is not just some power, but all power. It is not just some presence, but the one presence. It is really the essence of joy, of peace, of creativity, of wisdom, of abundance, of freedom, and really of unconditional love. It has been said that the starting point of spiritual realization is the right understanding of the one designated as the Almighty. But I would venture to believe that for as many different names as there are for this power and presence, that there are even more ways to describe the thing itself. I think that while each of us when we arrived on the planet, probably had the same awareness of this power and presence, that we began very quickly to be taught to absorb or to believe in whatever our parents or our particular cultures or our particular race or our particular religion or our lack of religion thought, said, or believed about God. 
And what was said spoke so loudly that we began at a very early age to embody the ideas as our own, or not. Many of us in this room today grew up with no real concept of God, and many grew up with a concept or an idea of God that didn't really feel right to them, that didn't resonate with them even when they were a very young child. But if not that idea or that concept of God, then what idea or what concept of God? Joel Goldsmith says, the hardest part of your spiritual journey is to rise above the concepts of God that you have always accepted. Whether your concept of God has come from a church, from your parents, or from your own experiences in life, Regardless of where or how you acquired your particular concept of God, and regardless of what that concept may be, it is not God. There is nothing that you know about God that is God. There is no idea of God that you can entertain that is God. There is no possible thought that you can have about God that is God. So it really makes no difference what our concept or our idea of God may be. It's always going to just be a concept or an idea. And that idea or that concept is not God, but just really something that is simply pointing to God. Now the invitation, rather than trying to ask or to explain a particular concept of God is to simply rest in the acknowledgement that God is. When we look out at the beauty and the abundance that is nature or the orderly movement of the sun and the stars and the tides or the unfailing revolution of the seasons or the unbelievable wisdom that is contained in our own human bodies, how could there not be some kind of spiritual intelligence behind all of it? How could there not be? The Science of Mind first core concept says, all creation originates in the one. God is God is all that there is. So for me, in the beginning was God. And out of that God substance came everything else. It really could be no other way because there was nothing else. God is everywhere at all times in its fullness and in its wholeness. Ernest Holmes says, we believe in the incarnation of the Spirit in all people and that all people are incarnations of the one Spirit. So therefore, we believe that each human being is a creation of God, made by God out of God's stuff, a unique and individualized expression of it. No two of us exactly the same multiple manifestations out of one source. So if God is all that there is, and then, then every one and everything is absolutely an incarnation of the one. No one is left out. Nothing is left out. No matter what our human perceptions might be telling us, the truth is that we were all incarnations of the one, all a spark of the divine. There is no place where God is not, absolutely no place. Now, Ernest Holmes also says, we believe in the unity of all life and that the highest God and the innermost God is one God. So what this says to me is that God is not some man with a long white beard outside of ourselves, but actually a presence and a power, a consciousness that is within us, within all of us, within all of life. 
that God is within us and surrounds us, that we are Im immersed within it and it flows through us. Ever connected, no way to ever be truly separated. We can feel that way in our own minds at times, but we can never be separated. I've always loved the image that I believe Augustine brought forward that says that God is a sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. A sphere whose center is everywhere and whose circumference is nowhere. And Joel Goldsmith says about this idea, a sphere whose center is everywhere? Impossible. But wait, if the center is everywhere, it must be right where I am. Could this be the meaning of omnipresence? A point of light and of life and light present everywhere as each individualized expression? If this is true, then I am a center of God. It is an audacious thought with a sacrilegious tone. And yet, can a geographical center be otherwise in a dynamic and expanding universe? Every point in the sphere which is God is thus a bubbling forth of the infinite flow of life. A bubbling forth. I am a bubbling forth of the infinite center of life. Wow. That's amazing. That is powerful. But the underlying truth is that it's not my life and it's not your life, but it's God's life being expressed through and as each of us individually and collectively. Ernest Holmes says, we believe in the eternal goodness, the eternal loving kindness, and the eternal givingness of life to all. So this eternal givingness, not just at the moment that we arrived on the planet, but eternally, always present and always available. Everything, I mean everything, was created by love, out of love itself. It has always been so, and it will always be so. God plays no favorites, but gives to all equally not capriciously, not judgmentally, but it gives to all in equal measure according to our belief. According to our belief. This then <clears throat> is the idea of love. This is God as love. It is that inner loving presence, that mother, father, God, that which created us, that which sustains us, this power that is within us, that is closer than our very breath, that we can never be separate from, that is always available, and that is always willing to give us the kingdom of heaven on earth. Now the second core concept of the science of mind says that God is triune in nature, that it is threefold, right? that it has three aspects or modes within the one. These three aspects are spirit, soul, and body. And it's really uh, represented by our teaching symbol. So this teaching symbol, the whole, the entirety of it is God. And in actuality, there would be no outer lines, right? Because it is infinite. So there can be no boundaries. The top part, so it's divided into three sections. The top part is what's called the spirit. Now, specifically speaking, this spirit, this upper part, is God in, um, in the, the, our, the conscious aspect of God. But it's often used, right? Spirit is often used in place of or synonymous with God itself. So some people like to use the word spirit instead of God. But what we're talking about when we're saying spirit, we're talking about this upper section. Now it is, um, it is self-knowing. It is spontaneous. It is the reasoning aspect. It is volitional. The spirit is that which is the cause back of everything that there is. It is the knowing aspect of God. 
The middle section is called the soul or the universal law. Now, the soul or the universal law is the unformed substance or energy that everything is made out of. It is that soup that is just waiting to be told what to create, right? So it is the doing aspect of God. It is also the repository of all of our memories, both individually and collect in collective memories. That is the soul or the law. The bottom part is the body. Now the body is the body of God or our own physical bodies or the body of our affairs. It is all of our thoughts and beliefs in form. It is all of the material things or all of the circumstances, situations, and relationships of our lives. Now all three of these, all three, are the three aspects of God. Each one of them is very significant to our lives and no one of them is any more important than any one, than any of the others. Spirit, soul, and body. Now the way it works is the creative process, is through the creative process. The creative power of mind, and it operates in accordance with an unfailing law. Now, if you've been around the center for any length of time, you have probably heard someone describe this law uh, as they talked about the natural laws, the physical laws that we have in the universe that we can use. <clears throat> that the physical laws in the universe work the same way all of the time for everyone with no exception. So a couple of examples of these physical laws would be gravity or electricity. So gravity will hold a piano in place just as easily as it holds a piece of paper. And electricity will light up an entire castle or an entire city as easily as it will light up one single room. There is no judgment as to why or what. The laws always are going to work the same way for everyone all of the time. Neither gravity nor electricity really cares what we're doing with it. They really don't have an opinion about why we're using them. They just do what we ask them to do. That's their nature. Now Jesus proclaimed a law of faith. And that law of faith is, it is done unto you as you believe. This is the law of faith. And the law of faith, like all of the physical laws in the universe, always works the same way for everyone all of the time with no exception. The law knows nothing about big or small. It doesn't care whether the person that is using the law is young or old, whether they're rich or they're poor, or whether they're male or female. It just simply says yes. It has no judgment on why we want to do or be or have anything. It simply says yes. Now we like to equate this creative process with an idea, and it, half of the room is going to laugh, with the seed, the soil, and the plant. It's going to make it really easy for you. Now th this creative process is represented by the V that runs through our teaching symbol. The spirit, right, the spirit, this knowing volitional spirit has an idea, and that's the seed. And the seed is released into the soil of the soul or the universal law. And that soul or universal law then acts upon that idea or that seed and creates a plant or 
whatever it is that, that was re released into it. So it will produce an exact replica of whatever thought went into it. And this is how it works on the macrocosm when we're talking about God. But it works exactly the same way when we're talking about each one of us on that microcosm. We have a thought, that seed. That thought is placed down into the soil of our consciousness, into that soul or into that universal law where it is then clothed in form and out pictures in our lives as an exact replication of the thought that we put into it. That is the creative process. That is how our thoughts, our words, our feelings, our beliefs create. That is how we create the experiences of our lives. The spiritual law is always a mirror that reflects our mental attitudes. Those thoughts, feelings, beliefs that we hold to be true about ourselves or about each other or about the universe and our place in it. If we tell ourselves, I am abundant, creative, joyful, and free, and we really believe it, then that will be the experience of our lives. If we tell ourselves that I am not worthy of being abundant, creative, joyful, and free, and we really believe that, even if we believe it unconsciously, then that will be the experience of our lives. And this is just as true as our awareness that if we take an acorn and we plant it, that it will produce an, uh, an oak tree and not a peach tree. Or if we take a carrot seed and we plant it, that it will produce a carrot and not a potato. We can be just as sure about that creative process as we are about the creative process of the seed, the soil, and the plant. Ernest Holmes says, the law of faith operates with integrity on the definite idea, thought, expectancy, or acceptance implanted into it. And what I really want you to hear are those two words towards the end of that quote, expectancy and acceptance. For me, as I think about this creative process, this this is the point at which we might notice that we have some resistance. This is the point at which we might be saying to ourselves, I have been affirming this or that forever and ever, and it has yet to manifest in my life. This is the point at which we could shift our thinking and completely change everything. Now, when we recognize this moment, this moment in time, this moment within the creative process, then the question to ask ourselves is, how much am I willing to accept? How much am I willing to accept? Is there any little place in me that feels like I'm unworthy? Like I don't deserve what I want. Is there any place within me that aligns itself with some race consciousness idea that says that I am too old or too young or too tall or too short or too whatever? Is there a place in me that harbors some old wound because of something that was said to me a long time ago that continues to affect my ability to accept all the good that is mine. What am I, you know, how, how much am I willing to accept? Or we could ask ourselves, what am I expecting? How deep is my faith? 
Do I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I am a child of God, that I am surrounded by the allness of possibility, that I am imbued with the creative process, and that I have the conscious ability to be able to utilize the law of faith to bring into my life all that I desire? What am I expecting? It is also true that the seeds that we place into our garden must have time. They must be in that soil for a period of time, time enough to allow them to mature, and that we have to tend to that soil as those seeds move through that growth process. <clears throat> the same is true for the ideas that we put into that universal law that soil of our minds. Ernest Holmes says, the seed must be left in the creative soil of the mind until it can mature. There is a time for sowing as well as a time for the harvest. Plants must not be pulled up or interrupted in the process of their growth. I, maybe I should say that again. I got a couple laughs up here. Plants must not be pulled up or interrupted in the process of their growth. They must be watered with hope, fertilized with expectancy, and cultivated with enthusiasm, gratitude, and joyous recognition. How many times can you think of a time in which you planted a seed and then thought, oh, how's it doing? Can it really happen? Maybe I better look. And then you pull it up. And you have to start all over again. Sometimes things take time. Bamboo. Bamboo is in the ground for five years before a shoot actually appears on the top of the, of the soil. Because all of that time, it is preparing itself to become an 80-foot stock. And I'll tell you, that 80-foot stock can happen in a week. But you have to be patient. So there's a law, right? A spiritual law, and it works on a mental plane. The mental produces the physical. Back of everything on the physical plane is a invisible prototype of perfection. Don't you love that? An invisible prototype of perfection that exists on the spiritual plane. This law is mechanical, and it, uh, its nature is to manifest. And it manifests inevitable results with mathematical certainty. It always says yes, and it always works the same way for everyone all of the time. Now, we don't have to coerce, compel, control, we don't have to manipulate or force or demand or beg or beseech. We don't have to bargain. We don't have to plead. And we don't have to rationalize. None of it. We only have to know the truth beyond a shadow of a doubt. We only have to know who we are at our very core. We only have to align with that truth of who and what we are. We only have to remember the power and presence that is within us. It is our awareness of this truth and our faith in it. I'm going to say that again. It is our awareness of the, our, this truth and our faith in it that is the most important thing in our lives. The most important thing in our lives. Jesus had this awareness and that faith, and that is why water was turned into wine, the blind made to see, and the lame to walk. And it is said that we too have this ability to do these things and even more. In order for us to have the awareness that Jesus had, we, we have to expand our mental scope, our whole mental scope has to be broadened. We, if we create only from that which we already know, nothing will ever change. If we create, 
if we continue to really create from only the thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and attitudes that we have had in the past, then we cannot experience anything beyond what we have already experienced. If we continue to create from the same expectancy or from the same level of acceptance, then we will never have all that we desire. We have to broaden our scope. Something within us must change in order for that to happen. If we want to reap joy, abundance, peace, creativity, wisdom, freedom, whatever it is that we want to reap, we must keep our minds filled with similar thoughts. We have to. And we have to keep those similar thoughts not just for ourselves, but for everyone. This may be <laughs> the rub is. We can't just have those thoughts for ourselves, but we have to have them for others because we can't think one thought for ourselves and hold that thought and then think and hold another completely opposite thought for someone else. It is impossible. It is impossible. And the truth is that the, the thought that has the most energy behind it, that has the most emotion behind it, is the thought that will always win. That's the thought that's going to be made manifest in your life. And if you think about it, sometimes those things that we have about other people, we have a little bit more juice on it, right? We're, we're, yeah, sometimes that happens. We, we are always going to reap what we sow. So the invitation today is to continue to use our spiritual practices to shift our perception of ourselves and uh, the experiences of our lives. The, the invitation is to be willing to forgive, to listen for our own inner wisdom, to tend to the soil of our minds, and to use our imagination to think outside of the box. The invitation is to shift the context that we are creating from, to enlarge the container that is our consciousness so that we can go beyond where we have ever been before so that we can consciously and powerfully create lives that we love to live. This then is the thing itself and how it works. Please repeat after me. There is a power for good in my life. There is a power for good in my life. It is the thing itself. It is the thing itself. I choose to consciously align with the way it works. I choose to consciously align with the way it works. And to consciously use it for good in my life. And so it is. And so it is. <laughs> Let's turn within. Mm, as I turn within, I am so aware. So aware of that power and presence that is within me and surrounding me. I'm s swimming in it. I wrap it around me like a blanket, knowing that I can never be separated from it, knowing that it is the very essence of the peace, the joy, the creativity, the abundance, the wisdom, the freedom, and the unconditional love that I so desire to experience in my life. I know that it is that which created me, that right where I am, God is in its fullness and just as in its wholeness. That I am a hologram of the thing itself. And just as I know that this is my truth, I know that it is the truth of each and every person here this morning, each and every person within the sound of my voice. 
We are all created by it, out of itself. Our ambassadors of its presence can never be separated from it and can use its power of creation on the micro, in the microcosm for our own design to create experiences and relationships that we absolutely love. And so I claim ease and grace for us around remembering the truth of who we are, around aligning with that truth, around speaking those words and loosing them into that soil, tending to that soil, being patient as that seed does what it does and the law does what it does and then experience gratitude as we recognize the outpicturing in our lives of an exact replica of that which we spoke into the law because that's the way it works and I'm so grateful that it does so grateful for this power and presence this ability to create so grateful for the power of prayer knowing that these words are loosed into a law that only ever says yes that they are clothed in form even as they are spoken and so I speak them and I release them with a full measure of acceptance and unwavering expectancy of their manifestation letting go and letting God be God and I invite each of us to anchor this prayer for ourselves and for each other simply by saying and so it is and so it is amen thank you everyone